Richards has been a magician and a mentalist specializing in cold reading. And in fact, I think, weren't we, you and I were on the first episode ever of Penn and Teller's Bullshit. He was, uh, he was exposing some higher comedians, yeah. Um, but he was doing that by showing how this is a skill that anyone could acquire. So, uh, Mark Edward is the author of a book called Psychic Blues. He's been on the scene a long time and he is one of our foremost experts on the art of cold reading. Everybody, please welcome Mark Edward. Woo! Hey, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, allowing me to come in here and, and do this this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Edward, and I am a thought reader. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. And I know what this gentleman right here is thinking. And, you know, this is, this is what I do. Um, but my real interest has really, for a long time, has been skepticism and, and understanding not just how these things work, but why they work. And uh, I think the big crossover for me was uh, magic is uh, nice to look at, it's very clever, and it's a, a manipulative skill that's really important to understand. Uh, I, my grandfather was a magician, so I was lucky to be his guinea pig for many years. And that's really when I started thinking about skepticism. Things are not the way they always seem. As a matter of fact, most of the times they're not. But magic isn't enough, because we live uh, right now, I believe, uh, I call it the golden age of the calm. Yes. And I think you will agree. And it's not only, a, a couple, last year I talked about we're in a post-truth era. That doesn't even cover it anymore. And one of the things I've realized is it's always been a post-truth era. It really hasn't changed that much. but. Now I think it's, it's really more important than ever to understand cold reading and verbal deception and how you can be tricked into believing that somebody could know everything about you when they really don't, nor do they care to really know anything, anything about you. Uh, it's all a very clever ruse. So, what I'm going to talk about today, how many people were in the cold reading workshop last year? <coughs> well, Ray Hyman was the host last year. We worked together. Uh, I'm not gonna, how many people know what cold reading is? Cool. Oh, that's the entire room. I don't have to cover that. <laughs> so you understand the basics. Well, last year, Ray and I did the workshop, and I highly recommend. Uh, getting in touch with Ray or talking to him, he's here, uh, about getting his, his handbook that he did because he updates it from year to year and it's really, really very good. So that's the basics. He covers a lot of the basics and I'm going to you know, touch on them so that you understand. But my idea is to try and evolve, uh, evolve the paradigm a little bit away from just your standard uh, bullshit, uh, you know, generalities, and try and focus a little more on what I'm the most involved with. Uh, Susan and I just came back from a uh, trip to Europe. It's called the About Time Tour because we were like, it's about time people start, you know, stop singing and start swinging. It's it's just. Lies have become an accepted business practice, okay? So the title of my notes is called Cold Reading is Now a Survival Skill. <laughs> and I really feel strongly that this is true. People need to understand what goes on with this because in the next 10 years, uh, it's going to become imperative to understand what exactly you're being subjected to or... I mean, we've all read 1984. It's past that now. It's almost too late. So, and I can't go after uh, political candidates. I'm just the one person. But I can at least attack the bottom feeders. <clears throat> and so that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being aware of 
deception, which is what magicians do. This direction, this deception, cold reading is using uh, your best guess, and uh, and then you know starting with something and then kind of course correcting with the, the sitter or the person you're talking to in order to convince that person that you have some sort of super normal powers. And if it is done correctly, particularly with some of the things I'm going to talk about later on, it can really pass for the real thing. And the real thing is what I'm always going for. In fact, my latest book, if I can just throw in a pitch, is called The Real Deal. Okay? This is a magic book. It's for magicians. It's not for everybody. But the idea is the real deal. Somebody said to me, you're the real deal. And I didn't really understand that, but then, I start, then they started explaining to me what I had convinced them of, and I was flattered by that, because to be the real deal, I mean, if I could really talk to dead people, I'd be the most dangerous person on the planet. <laughs> and this is what I try and tell people. Where's your common sense, okay? I mean, I would be in a bunker with my brain wired up by the CIA or the NSA. I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be selling tickets to an arena to have you come and me tell you about Grandma's Rose Garden. It's just, I don't get that, you know? I, I never could get it from the very beginning when I first saw it. Like, my logic said to me, well, couldn't they do so much more, like maybe solve a crime? Wouldn't that be a, a, a change of pace for John Edward or, or the new one, Tyler Henry? How many people have seen this kid, Tyler Henry? Oh, make a note if you don't know about him, because he's the latest flavor of the month, and he is a young kid who's coming up in the psychic world. And I hate to say it, but I think we're going to be seeing a lot of Tyler, because he is, he's got an infectious smile, he's young, he's... He's what I call the new generation of psychics. I call them fuzzy sweater psychics. Because, thank goodness the day of Sylvia Brown is over. You know, that Sylvia Brown who used to talk like this. And that, you know, the, the mean-spirited, new-age witch type is now gone. Now it's fuzzy sweater. It's, it's the girl next door. It's the, the young kid next door who... Who, who doesn't really profess to have supernatural powers, he just, he just knows things, right? So it's kind of this innocence that has started to infect the new, I don't even want to call it the new age, because that's, like I say, it's past. So anyway, some of the things to watch out for are this fuzzy sweater thing, because uh, it's, it's called a reality show, but it's anything but a reality show. And I try my hardest to appear in as many real reality shows as possible. I just did uh, Adam Ruins Everything. I don't know if anybody saw that. Woo! Uh, that just aired night of Tuesday. Tuesday night. Uh, and it is, if you tear apart Teresa Caputo, without mentioning her name, if you know who she is. Um, so the idea is... We've tried to do skeptical television, and Jim Underdown will tell you about that for years. People don't want the truth. They want their nightmares. They want their, their, their wishes to be fulfilled. Uh, so let's start with one of the easy things to do. If you want to become famous overnight, make bold statements as if they're facts. That's all. Okay? Get a platform, get out there, make bold statements as if they are facts. Don't ask questions. Ever seen any of these people like Lisa Williams? I think Jim Underdown clocked her in at something like 43 questions in one minute. So this again, I don't understand. If you really are a psychic, you should not know. You should not be asking, is this about this? Does that mean anything to anybody? Blah, 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 blah. No, you were supposed to know, okay? You were supposed to know things. So, cold reading is making, to me, you're making bold statements as facts. And I'm going to add a whole other level into this. So, I want to just try real quick to, to give you an example of making a bold statement as if it, if it were a fact. Um, this lady right here. Okay, I want you to just, um, 
there's an older woman standing behind you. Is that, is that making any sense? Not yet? And she's, she's telling me she loves this idea that you spent this time on water. She's, the ocean is, is very important to you, and it was very important to her in some way. And she's also, she's really reminiscing uh, with you in a way um, about, about the uh, April in Paris. No? You weren't in Paris recently? You were in Paris recently. You gotta work with me a little bit here, okay? Like, this is not an exact science that I do. It was May. It was May? April, May, yeah. <laughs> and she says, you got a thing about, um, uh, i got to concentrate a little bit. Excuse me, this takes a moment. Um, Harrison Ford? Did you just see the movie Blade Runner? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's very excited that, that you weren't that impressed with the movie, but it was okay. So, this is an adventuresome woman. I don't know who it is. Now, here's the key word. Does that make sense to anybody in the audience? It does to you, right? So that's the real thing. If I can connect to one person and get something like that, that's pretty cool. But the average way a cold reader will work is they will say, I am seeing flowers. Uh, I'm seeing a clown in a graveyard. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Does that mean anything to anybody? <laughs> Believe it or not, at Dragon Con two years ago, I said, I see a clown in a graveyard, and a woman raised her hand. <laughs> I was blown away. <laughs> so the idea is make bold statements as fact. Even though I was sort of asking some questions there, you really want to make bold statements. So cold reading is making bold statements and, and standing by them. You know, you're the psychic. You're supposed to know. That's one thing I'll hang to John Edward, no relation, by the way, is that uh, if he gets something and the person says, like she said, I don't know, he just stands by it until they acquiesce to him. Because nobody wants to be, you know, that embarrassed in front of a studio audience. Eventually you're going to go, oh, okay, yes, uh, April in Paris, it was in May, see, so, so, so. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of impressions I get from this group. Who's William? Is there a William in this group? Raise your hand, please. William, stand up for a second, if you would. Because I'm getting a, 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 a person around your age who's passed on. Hold your hands out in front of you like this. He's saying he sees a rock in your hand. Does that make sense to you? Unfortunately, it does. It does. <laughs> Can you tell everybody why? Because I'm an ex-geology professor. I don't see you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, being specific is important. Making bold statements as if they're facts. Now, you can, you can massage people with cold reading all you want. And what we have found is that the, the, the hot mediums of today, uh, the ones that are on the ascendant, that means they haven't actually reached a plateau yet where they're making enough money so they can relax. They're trying to make a name for themselves. So they will use some other more devious methods. But once they get to this kind of plateau, they get lazy and they use cold reading. So let me go back to my notes again. So. That's really the number one rule. Make bold statements as if they're facts. If you can say a bold statement as if it's a fact, with all the sincerity you can muster, then you can make it in the psychic business. I'm telling you. And it is a business. Do not kid yourself at all. There is very little metaphysical or spiritual attributes going on, in case you didn't know. It is a big business. Make quick, 
hasty judgments about people, places, and situations. Now I'm going to come to a thing that we're all learning about that is unfortunately part of our everyday life today. And it's my opinion that some of the things that are going on in our society today are reflections of many, many years of mediums and psychics plying their trade. People in power have learned from these, these cons. They understand human nature. Like we have a, a term called situational awareness. Have you heard of this? Situational awareness is a law enforcement term, CIA, FBI. Interrogators. What's the difference between an interrogator and a psychic? Nothing. <laughs> the only difference is one works to supposedly protect us, the other person wants to separate you from your mind. But they're inter those two terms are now interchangeable. So situational awareness means you walk into an environment, the first thing you want to do is look around, where are the exits? Take a look around. Who's the most unscrupulous person, looking person in the audience? It's called profiling, but let's call it like it is. You look around, who's the one who looks the most dangerous? Okay, I'm going to be watching out for him. That's what psychics do, okay? See something, say something. Haven't we heard that a hundred thousand times? What does a psychic do? You see something, you say something, right? And it doesn't have to make any sense at all. Because the people in the audience, especially if you paid a lot of money, if you're sitting in the first three rows and you paid $300 for your ticket, you're going to make those connections for that person. You don't want them to be wrong. You want them to be right. So if I make a suggestion, again, the clown in the graveyard, hmm, people start to think, where did I see a clown in the graveyard? Well, I saw a clown, and I've seen a graveyard. Well, maybe, you know, it's, it's human nature to do this. You buy a lemon, you don't want to admit it's sour. You just keep trying to make that lemon better and better and better and better. That's what happens to us. And we don't want to admit when we've been taken. So, of course, you want everything to be right. So you add that into the mix as well. Uh, so, again, uh, interrogation techniques. It's opened up into a whole new world now, which to me is not surprising, but it's amazing how it's sort of filtered into the, the psychic thing is filtered into, uh, into the world of uh, intelligence. It's kind of a weird word to use, but uh, we'll, for example, uh, they found out you know, waterboarding doesn't work. It doesn't give, you know, torture does not give decent information. So what's the new way? If you talk to the people who do this for a living, you make friends with that person. You, you make them comfortable. Hey, are you comfortable? Can I get you a drink or something? How's the family? You know, in other words, you don't try to kill them. You try to make them comfortable. That's what psychics do. You ever walk by one of these parlors that says psychic and the neon's in the window and you walk by and Everything's comfortable, soft couch, pillows, you know, there's a, there's a statue of Buddha there. Everything to make you comfortable. Can I get you some tea? Are you relaxed? How can I help you? So, it's very hard to argue with somebody who's saying, how can I help you? Okay? What's your question is what they really want, they really want to say. And I guarantee you go in to see one of these psychics, don't say anything, and you don't give them any cues, you don't give them any body language, you sit perfectly still, even then, there are ways that they can follow exactly. I tell people, back in the day when I did this, and I did this only to get information for my book, <laughs> Psychic Blues, what I did as a magician, I saw these guys on television, I said, if they can do this, I can do it. Because most psychics that you see have no stage presence, they have no personality, they're just banking on their bullshit to get them by. So I said, well, you know, I do magic, I should be able to combine the two and be entertaining at the same time. So I made it my goal to get to the top of this mountain of bullshit, and at the top, I had to stop after a while because I had gotten enough information, just couldn't take it anymore. 
it's like the Harlan Ellison had this great anecdote about Hollywood where he said, Hollywood is like uh, climbing, to the, climbing up to the top of this mountain of dung to get to the roads. But once you get to the top, you can't smell anymore. So that's what it was like. It was like, I wanted to learn, but I learned so much that I was overwhelmed by it. And I said, okay. And also, I started to believe in myself a little bit. Oh, that's when it gets tricky. When you start to get a few testimonials that say, God bless your gift. You are one of the gifted ones. Where do I send the money? You start to go. And no, that road trip wasn't that great anyway. I can do a car trick. And... So there's a lot of pitfalls and traps that you can get trapped in. But I had a conscience. I had to wake up every morning and look in the mirror, so I could not do that. Speaking of cards, you're laughing. <laughs> JB, where's JB? Right here? JB. You like card tricks, don't you? Yeah. JB likes card tricks. And there's one, you know what's interesting? What? Your, your daughter? Did she get married or she's getting married soon? Soon. Soon. In the next two or three months? Within the year. What do you guys see this stuff or something? <laughs> I know this is a skeptical audience. But... And by the way, JB, we never met before today, right? Not before today. Think about that. <laughs> it's a great mentalist line. We never met before tonight. It could be true, but there's more. And there's no way I could know this about you. Virgo, right? Whoa. Whoa. Just a lucky guess. Okay? See, in other words, go with your lucky guesses, go with your gut feeling. And another thing to remember about good cold readers is when you're wrong, and go figure this, when you're wrong, it makes it more believable. It's kind of like homeopathy. The more you dilute it, <laughs> you dilute it more and more and more, it's more powerful. I don't get that. I don't understand. It's like a psychic, but I do understand human nature, and here's how it works. If I get something wrong, or I'm not 100%, like April or May, it makes it more believable. Because people say, look, if it was a trick, he would have got it dead on. And believe me, I've seen some psychics that get it dead on, and I know they can't be real. See? Because when you're wrong, it humanizes what you do. It, people relate more to somebody who has to struggle a little bit. They don't want somebody just rattling off all these facts. They want, they want to see you hang out in the wind a little bit. It's, it's human nature. And it, it, by humanizing you, they feel closer to you. Oh, he's one of us. He's not a perfect God. He is not Godlike. So, being wrong, you can be right. And I've seen John Edward on the TV show that Jim Underdown and I did. He actually says to the camera, he says, I can be wrong and still be right. You gotta love that. <laughs> now, for me, as a performer, I love all this stuff. Okay? I really do. It's part of my, part of, very close to my heart. All these, all the artifice of it, the, just the, I don't know how to describe the, the machinations that psychics and mediums use. I love it. I don't like the outcome. I don't like what it does to people and how it can ruin people's lives. And I've seen it do that, so I know. From, from, from right in a chair, I've seen it take thousands of dollars away from people. So, and hurt people, especially bereaved people or people who've lost their children. I mean, it's just the ugliest thing. That's why my book is called Psychic blues, because I don't have a problem with people talking to each other. And if you want to get a second opinion, go for it. But if that person says to you, right before you leave, 
But wait, I see a dark cloud. You better give me your phone number and your address. I'm going to pray for you. And if the prayer doesn't work, you'll have to come back. I mean, this is, this is the manipulation. And when you see a medium or a con, like a, a, a cold reader on stage, their stage performance, standing up here and doing all this stuff, that's only a precursor. All they really want to do is call out the people who they can start doing private readings for. It's an advertisement. It's a performance. They are performance artists, and what they're doing is they're setting up. Every time they'll say, at the end, well, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope I've been able to help a few people, and my assistant will be in the back ready to sign you up if you'd like to have a private reading. But I'm booked for the next three or four years. Right. So, so that's the con. And in the old days, the mentalists used to call it back-of-the-room sales. They would say, if you're interested in what I do, please see my assistants in the back. And then they get a hook in that person, and they do not let go. So you already know all this. You want to know some more tricks. OK. Oh, yeah, situational awareness. I love that. Uh, see something, say something. Oh. Really, and this is key, being psychic just means paying attention. <laughs> Write that down, okay? And any, if you think people are going to be psychic in the future, they're going to be paying attention in the future. But paying attention in a much more technological way. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if I were to say, if you were to come into my psychic shop, and I want to be able to tell you things about yourself. And one of my favorite lines that I've heard for decades now, and I truly love it. There's no way in the world that person could have known that about me. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. <laughs> it's just a matter of perception. If you do this, I mean, I, I get everything I need to know usually before the person even sits down at my little table. They walk 10 steps from where they're standing, sometimes in a line of 20 or 30 people to get their 10-minute tarot reading. By the time they walk from there to there, I've got it. I've looked at their shoes, I've looked at their hair, male or female. I've looked at their clothing, I've looked at their jewelry, I look at the general demeanor. By the time they sit down, they don't have to ask me a question. I pretty much know, and it's only going to fall in love, health, love, money. Okay? Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> love, money, maybe travel, maybe health. But for the most part, that's it. So uh, then it gets into the speaking to the dead part. That's a little more complicated. But you still get a pretty good foot in the door just by looking at the obvious tells. They're called tells. And gamblers know about tells. My grandfather was not only a magician, but a gambler. What does that tell you? Could his grandson possibly be a con artist? <laughs> I mean, he was a wonderful man, but I never really learned whether he learned how to deal from the top because he wanted to know when he was being cheated or yeah, what he's cheating. My grandma never told me, but I have my suspicions. The point is, there, there's a lot of things we can do to protect ourselves, and that's, that's really the most important thing. Get people to think, pay attention. Go with your gut level. Um, oh, here's another great one. Again, I'm not giving you really specific tricks. You can buy my books for those. But no, a, a one that I really like. And this is one, if, if I'm doing a show and say it's an hour long where I'm standing on stage doing psychic readings, boy, that's a long time. And I start to run out of material because you don't want to repeat the same reading for the same crowd. You know, I don't want to accidentally say the same thing. It's supposed to sound like it's just rolling off the psychic top of my head, you know? Like a good, a good comedian, you see Jay Leno, you know? How many people have seen Jay work around? And the first time you see him, he's like, hey, yeah, where are you from? And you're going, look at this guy. He's just bouncing off the walls. How creative. 
Then you see him the second time, the same thing. He's saying the same things, but he's making it sound fresh. Third time, same thing. You're going, well, I see. Okay? So a psychic has to be careful not to do that. You have to sound fresh. So one of the ways, and try this, if you get stuck, somebody says, well, okay, give me a psychic reading. Just start talking about your own life. It is the 19th, isn't it, John? <laughs> It is in November. Who was born on November 19th? Anybody on the 19th? Wow, that's weird. I'm going to make a note of that. There's usually one on the 19th somewhere in a crowd like this. Uh, anyway, I, I'm feeling another reading coming on, okay? <laughs> Shift the focus, keep moving. A psychic is always a moving target. Um, PK. Initials PK? That be you? No? Right you are PK. Yes. There's a, there's, a, there's a terrific psychic phenomenon called PK. Are you familiar with it? Yes. Uh, Has that ever happened to you in your life? No. See, I'm asking questions. I should not be asking questions. I should just be knowing things. Okay, because I get I get something really spectacular about you, okay? Can you see me standing up here? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is just for you. Tell me why I'm getting this. <laughs> You're laughing, but does that mean anything to you? What, what is, why is that important to you? Just, I'm asking a question so you can fill I in the blank. Tai Chi. You do Tai Chi. <laughs> Thank you. And wait, no, there's something else. There's something else. I, I, I appreciate your applause, but uh, say that I have a weak ending. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very healthy person. You eat healthy, is that true? <laughs> like I said, we try to eat healthy health and, and wellness and um, big, big bowl of chestnuts. Yes? <laughs> big bowl of chestnuts. And I want people to say there's no way in the world he could know that. Save it because I may have some more for you, okay? <laughs> And you grew those chestnuts, am I right? Yes. Yes. Wow. All right, let's see what I can do. Listen, then speak up. Start with the obvious. So we start with obvious things, and then we try and get more specific. And then people walk away saying to their friends, he was so specific. Well, yeah, that's what people want to see, okay? So cold readers are one thing. And again, I'm not really that worried about, you know, you go to, you'll be going to a Halloween party and some little old lady be doing carol readings or palmistry. I mean, it starts there, but who really cares? I'm talking about the real grief vampires, that's what we call them. Ooh. These are the ones that we need to at least become aware of and fight for some kind of balance in their, the way they are covered by the media because they're not nice people. They take advantage. But, you know, I mean, yeah, it, and people always say they, see, they, go to, they go to the carnival and they see this, this grizzled little old lady and she's got the, 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 the hoop earring and the babushka over her head and she's, she sits to sit down and suddenly she knows all these things about you. Well, of course. You know? She learned it from her mother, and her mother learned it from her mother, and it's a family tradition. That's all she may have ever done in her entire life. So do you think she knows some shit about people? It's not paranormal. It's just intuitive. Somebody who knows how to tell a story. It's storytelling. And I'm fascinated by that because I like to be a storyteller, a storyteller myself. And I do magic, and I love wonderment. But when it gets out of balance, I get a little worried. 
That's why my book is subtitled The Conflicted Medium. See? Because I love this stuff, but I hate it. So there may be a little schizophrenia going on here. Okay? Because I love the fact that I can get you to wonder what if, but I don't like the fact that it's mumbo jumbo, which is what we call it. So, keep moving on here. Oh, no, I thought I had something. <laughs> it started and sometimes it just jumped into my head and uh, Let me get to some meaty, meaty stuff here. Oh yeah, you know, I was talking about your, your shoes. People, we all know this, look at people's shoes, you know. Your shoes are talking to me. Can you believe that? It's true. I mean, you just have to use common sense. And that's why the, the Dale Carnegie course, I don't know if you ever heard about that. It was a great manual for psychics, because it was about salesmanship. If you were a shoe salesman, and you sold shoes in a shoe store for 30 years, the guy comes in the door, like I said, you already know before he even starts shopping how much he's going to spend and what kind of shoes he's going to buy. Is he dressed like an outdoorsman? Is he dressed like a millionaire? Most of the time, there are, there are uh, exceptions to these rules, but who cares? You can make a mistake. You're only psychic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so your shoes will talk to you. And I'm going to mention a book, if I can remember the name of it. What Everybody Tells You. It's by a guy named Joe, oh, I forgot his name. He's an ex-FBI uh, interrogator. And it's basically about body language. It is fascinating stuff. Because you read that book, and I guarantee all the people that we see on television that are so-called psychics, they have this book in their library. Because it describes, do you know what I'm talking about? No, but I wanted to comment that you're, you're talking about the shoes and looking at the shoes. Yeah. You, sound, you remind me of Sherlock Holmes speaking. Well, you know, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of similarity in a way, and I'm reminded that his creator Arthur Conan Doyle right. claimed to not believe or, or to believe. Oh, yeah, he believed in spirits. Yeah. Yet, you're telling me, based on my reading of, of the stories, yeah. that actually he understood what they were doing. Well, but see, he may have been one of these people who had a blind spot. There are a lot of skeptics out there who have blind spots. You know, you can say, hey, you know, uh, homeopathy is a bunch of bull, uh, uh, this and that, and this and that and the other, and then they'll say, oh, but not my psychic. So, I mean, we can't fault people for everything, you know. He wrote those great stories, so what are you going to do? You know? But you sound like Sherlock Holmes' explanation of, Yes, I saw him when he came in. It was his shoes. It was blah, blah, blah. Yes. And in 10 feet, I knew that. But it's common sense, really. An and observation. An observation. And I think that we are kind of in this era now where it's not politically correct to profile somebody or make those kind of judgments. But guess what? We do it automatically. And if you can turn it to your advantage, people are going to do it. Police do it all the time. So this guy I'm talking about, Joe, oh, I can't remember this name. What is it? Navarro. Navarro. Joe Navarro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get his book. It is unbelievable. I mean, he can tell you things just about the way people stand, what direction their feet are turned in. If somebody's talking to you and their feet are turned towards you, whether they're sitting down or standing, that means they're engaged with you and they're interested in what you have to say. If they're turned away, it means they really want to get away from you. <laughs> it's stuff like that. And you read it and you say, okay, and you try it and pretty soon you start to realize, yeah, that's pretty much true. So a lot of this has to do with science. But to the average person, they don't care about science. So it comes off as miraculous. I hear music. I hear music. This is very interesting. It's a guitar playing. Would that be you, sir? Selling them? You play guitar? Yeah. You don't? I do. Who? 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He was like an old world guy. 
what he would do, he was brilliant. He'd have a room like this, the guy would come up, ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Kingston, and he'd come in the back door, and he'd start going towards the front of the room, talking to people, and he'd go, oh, next time it's going to be a girl, congratulations. <laughs> if he'd get somebody who was actually going, he'd stay with that person and keep pumping them, keep going, and as soon as they'd go, then he'd go to the next person. And he'd get the time he got to the front of the room, he was done. <laughs> he didn't have to do anything, because he saw, because everyone was turning around, watching him, going, wow, he just hit, got all these hits. Maybe only 5% of them were real hits. But brilliant performance. Again, the performance, I love that. The con, I don't like. But he's still around somewhere. So the idea is generating hits, you do it any way you can. And I'm going to get out, get out the big guns in a second here. <clears throat> so the tells are very important to learn and understand. Uh, memorized and played back at the right moment in the psychodrama can come off as miraculous. And it really can become a psychodrama when you get to the point where somebody is in tears. That's a real experience. And I've done it. And I have not liked to do it, but after I had them in tears, I explained exactly what I had done. And they thanked me later. Because I saved them going to somebody who would have not stopped with explaining how they did it. They would have just kept going and going and going and mining that until the poor person was completely destroyed. So, um, hmm. yeah, so now we have higher levels of intelligence work called data mining and predictive analysis. You've all heard about that, right? You will. Okay. In other words, I'm not to the good part yet. Who, can, can somebody give me a time check? Because I, I never wear a watch. What do we got? Uh, so I got about 35. Running out of material. No, okay, that's all right. I can do this. Guru Mark here today. Did you see this? What's that? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, because I feel another reading coming on. <laughs> oh. This battery's running out, by the way. That's what I'm feeling. Um, wow, I just, I don't know what I'm, I just, that music thing was really getting me. Nobody plays guitar. Oh, well, that's just the way it goes. Um, this is probably going to get a couple of these. Is there a Dave in the room? <laughs> Dave. Davey you used to have a nickname when you were younger. Oh yeah. It was Davey, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you see how easy this stuff is? It takes a little work, that's all. But you know. Were you born in September? Yo. How was that eclipse? It was fantastic. Whoa. <laughs> this is a tough room. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Data mining, predictive analysis, yada, yada, yada. Um, okay, I'm going to save this part for the end. Yeah, you drag religion and prayer into it like thousands of psychics continue to do, and you have an almost airtight, unbeatable operation that gives you a 901 C3 to rake in even more cash. Five hundred one. Five hundred one. Did I say nine hundred one? Yeah, I'm thinking of a C. Sorry, five hundred one. So again, I talked about briefly the trends. I'm going to get to those in a second. Um, yeah, I mean, watch these, these so-called uh, reality shows, you know? Uh, Tyler Henry, you know, and, oh, he's just a nice kid, you know? And they wouldn't use an editor, would they? <laughs> I mean, it's not a reality show. Every, every person that's on that show signs a waiver so that they can be on camera. And when they sign a waiver, they're giving their name to that company to do whatever they want with it. So, I mean, 
There's got to be some balance somewhere. So again, Brain Games, anybody watch this show? Yeah. I highly recommend Brain Games. I recommend uh, Adam Ruins Everything. But that's kind of an unfortunate title, isn't it? <laughs> when, I, when I was putting up some little adverts about my show, they're like, oh, you mean Mark Ruins Everything? It's like, I can't help it. it we need some balance. And, and I keep crying out for it, and it's just not happening. And I've got a sad thing to say. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. No, I mean, really, we, we have to stand up as a group. That's why we're here, OK? People don't want the truth. We're going to have to shove it down their throats using humor. That is what I suggest. Humor is a great leveling mechanism, okay? If you can inject humor into what you're doing, you're going you're gonna to really make a difference. So it's difficult at best. If you're too serious, people will not listen to you. If you make fun of people, they will not listen to you. But like when I do my mentalism act, I don't do a disclaimer. I hate disclaimers. You all know what a disclaimer is? A disclaimer I'm just going to talk briefly about. When you walk out in front of an audience, you say, ladies and gentlemen, before you start, everything I do, there, I, I don't do anything supernatural. Anybody can learn how to do this. It's, there's not really nothing to it, you know? Why would I want to do that? You know? I mean, on one hand, I don't want people to think that I'm a supernatural giant. But it defies description, because if I was, I'd just go buy a lot of numbers. I wouldn't be standing up on the stage at the Magic Castle working for bad food and a few bucks a night. You know? So, so no, you don't have to do a disclaimer, but if you add in some humor, you, you make it so you're not taking yourself too seriously, hopefully, and you try and add a little skepticism in. Like in my book, I worked on the 900 lines. Do you remember those? I had so much fun with that. It was so great because people would call me and, and they'd say, I want some lotto numbers. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paying $3.99 a minute. I want lotto numbers. I'd say, OK, here they are. You got a pencil? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, 6, 12, 14, 29, 36, 72, 41. There you go. Gee, thanks. Thanks a lot. And I say, by the way, I didn't say they were winning a lot of numbers. <laughs> they go, what? You're supposed to know. And I say, oh, give me a break. You really think this is for real? I tell people the truth. And you know what? Because I told them that kind of truth, they call back again. <laughs> <laughs> because they say, that guy didn't lie to me. He was on the level. There must be something there. Yes. <laughs> Two out of five of those were right. Yeah, exactly. And what if they did win? See, I mean, the, the, the point is, you, you can still approach mentalism and mind reading and all these things that are, quote, supposedly supernatural in a way that's entertaining and pokes fun at the idea because we have all had things happen to us that we could not explain. Otherwise, I'm guessing you wouldn't be here today. Right? But to stand up on stage and say you can make them happen at a certain time for a certain amount of money for a ticket, that's where I have a problem, unless it's called a magic show, or a seance show, or a theater piece, or a play. But Tyler Henry, or uh, I don't know, any of these people that we see, they're just, it's like whack a mole knock one down, three more pop up. But we have to start somewhere. All right, I'm going to take a few questions and then I'm going to spill the beans. So, a few questions. I was just going to mention a new one that I talked to you about for Monica the Medium on ABC. Yes, Monica the Medium. And she's like a housewife or no, something. She's right? in high school. She's oh, she's in high school. Because she has visions when she's in the cafeteria school. Right. See what I mean? They're grooming them younger and younger so that they can have a career that will span decades. And by the time they're in their 50s, they'll still be chain smoking and talking like Sylvia Brown. That's what we've got. So as long as we encourage this without any uh, letters to the you know, people who run the channels, you know, don't keep doing it. Yes? How many, roughly what percentage would you think of people who 
actually believe that what they're doing is real. And for example, I Good know, question. I, I get asked that people, every single time. I know a lot of people have gone to Wiki training, you know, two days and hey, I'm a master. Yeah. And they're able to, to you know, use their tentacles and bring more people in because they actually think they know what they're doing. Right. Well, here's, here's the bottom line. Now, in answering your question, I can only answer that question based on my observation and experience, okay? And I say that because I don't want to get into it with people coming up to me after them. Not my psychic, probably not in this crowd, but it has happened. You know, they get very defensive. I would say that 95% of the people who are out there are calling themselves psychics or mediums are total charlatans, who know exactly what they're doing, and they are taking people for a ride day in, day out, year after year, and making really good book on that. Now, the other 5%, I kind of split it into two. 2.5% are people who are deluded. Uh, there are people who are off the meds. You know, they may be actually hearing voices telling them things. Can be very persuasive. Mild schizophrenia. There's all sorts of things that go on like this that can go undiagnosed. And we know because we worked with the CFI uh, for a couple of years, where we had some people who really thought they were the real deal, but they were off the meds. So there's the people who are deluded, who are mentally unstable, and then the other two. You remember him, don't you? <laughs> the other 2.5 percent are uh, kind, compassionate, caring people, you know, who, who have really good intuition. You know, because let's face it, intuition has a lot to do with this. It's just how you, your intent of what you're going to do with your intuition is the dividing line. If you intend to knowingly lie to people, that's different than sharing your intuitive outlook with another human being. So. That 2.5% unfortunately does not drive very well in relation to the other 97.5%. You can't really say that it's a good thing. So, that being said, that 2.5, I love them. I, I learned from them. Some of the best people I learned from, they weren't, they weren't trying to even make a living. They just felt like they liked talking to people, and they were good with people, and they were, and they did okay. They weren't millionaires. They didn't care, because they were on a higher spiritual plane. <laughs> you know, so. Do I have a question about Yes, sir. Well, how do you, when I, when I investigate psychics and mediums and, and try to test them, I often get the, what's the harm <laughs> question. How, oh, do you, well. how do you deal with that? Well, I tell people that all you have to do is go to uh, Tim Farley's whatstheharm.org <laughs> and you can see several hundred of the worst possible cases of people who have lost everything. And then I, I can tell from my personal experience, I've done a couple uh, news things for First Edition, uh, Inside Edition and other shows where we have seen people who have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, they've lost their business, they've lost their home, they've lost their marriage, everything gone because they put their faith in, in, a, in a psychic. But that, you can't really convince anybody until they really experience it for themselves. It's like an alcoholic, you know, you can't, you can't get somebody to go to AA, they have to want to go, you know, so if it gets bad enough, they'll say, yeah, you know, maybe that psychic wasn't that good. I'll give you an example, one woman, we interviewed her one year. She lost 150 grand. She had an art gallery in Beverly Hills, lost that. <sighs> lost basically everything. Her family turned against her. We did this show, we said, she's like, I'm never gonna do this again. I'm so embarrassed, blah, blah, blah. Then we went back a year later to interview her to see what happened. Oh, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to do with psychics anymore. I have a life coach now. <laughs> so I mean, I'm not putting down life coaches. That's cool, but the, the point is, it, it's very difficult to, when you're going to take someone's belief system like that 
you have to replace it with something. And hopefully that's skepticism. Okay? Yes? What is it that people do you think that they get out of it? I mean, I can understand going to the shows as entertainment. And right. Stuff, so it's amazing to see a magician go off and break things or not. Right. They've done it. But what if people honestly go for private readings? What, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I can only tell you from my experience, and that is because people want answers. And whenever we get in bad times, and let's just see, are we going through a rough spot right now? <laughs> like ever since 2008, it seems like it were. Or even you keep going back and back and back. Whenever things get really bad, people want answers. And whenever people want answers, there's always someone who will step forward and sell them one. <laughs> if it's not a politician, it's going to be Gypsy, you know, Gypsy Dave. <laughs> Using that term, sorry Dave. But there was a Gypsy Dave at one point in Hollywood, and he did very well. Anyway, I, I don't know. I, it, it's fascinating. That's one of the reasons I'm fascinated with it. But it's the same reason people will gamble. It's the same reason people use drugs. They think there's an easy step to some kind of higher higher way of thinking, when in reality, science is the higher way of thinking. But if people aren't aware of that, they don't they don't they don't know any other way. Did you have a question? Well, I just remember you used to always say that people aren't talking to each other enough. Well, that's true. And that's part of the reason why people go to psychics is yeah. they who's talking you're there you've got well, their one-on-one. I, one. I think they are now. I mean actually I used to have that phrase where I'd say people don't know how to talk to each other anymore. They just we're all looking at our phones and it's become you know, personal relationships are hard enough, but now it seems like it, people don't do that. I think that's changed a little bit. I think that because of social media, people are talking to each other. But they may not want to share their, their innermost secrets with somebody. And I can tell you from my experience with a, with a, a psychic, quotes, I sat down with people who started off totally defensive with their arms folded. They would, I knew right away they weren't going to tell me anything. But within seven or eight minutes, they're telling me their complete life story. They open up like a damn broke. So, it's, it's just having the right key to tweak that, and it's emotion. That's what it has to do with. A medium or a psychic works on your emotion, and if they can gain your trust, they'll open up. I, I, I read for a very famous movie producer, I won't mention his name, but a real tough guy who sat down and, so you're a psychic, huh? I was at a party. I was at a Hollywood party. A big deal, you know? It's like... Yeah, I am. I said right back to him because for me, I talk power to, I talk power to power, and most of these guys, they're not used to people talking to them like that. And one of the things I learned is, I don't care who you are, how big you are, you get the same reading as I give to the guy who takes out the trash. I don't care who you are. And when you talk to somebody like that, they respect you. And suddenly, here's this guy who's a huge movie guy. I'm telling him, you know, here's what your problem is, pal. And he's saying, wow, that is so accurate. We got to talk, he says to me. I said, we are talking. And you don't need to come back to me because I told you what you need to know. And he was just fucked with me. <laughs> so, so people want someone to take control and make decisions for them. And there's, to, to sort of go a little further, they want to be able to, number one, if things go the way the psychic said they would, they got a 50-50 chance, they want to be able to say, oh, my psychic told me that, and they're all proud of that. Or, some stupid psychic told me to do that. So that's why when you help somebody make a decision and you're a psychic, there's a huge responsibility to it. That's one of the reasons I, it's in my book, I couldn't handle that. Because I have people come back a year later and they say, I'll give you an example real quick, one of my favorite ones. Woman comes back to me. How, this is the Halloween hayride in LA, right? This is not a spiritual ashram. This is a hayride, okay? She comes back, she sits down, she's looking at me like she's all stunned. I'm like, what? 
everything you said last year came true. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said, everything? Everything. I can't believe it. I said, all right, well, I'm, I'll give you your general reading, and then I want you to tell me what, what I said that came true. So I give her the general tarot reading, blah, blah, blah. We're done. I say, now tell me what I told you that was that, that came true. And she goes, patience. I said, what? She said, you told me to have patience. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I didn't give her any specifics. She had patience. She found love in her life. She had patience. She got a new job. She had patience. So, you cannot argue with that. The tarot cards, they're just a bunch of archetypes. They're archetypes that are printed on paper that are common to all people. That's all they are. And you lay them out and you just read them like a storyteller. And people make the connections for you. They will do it. They're, and that's why I tell people before I give them a tarot reading, I say, I want you to think of one question, just one. And if I do my job right, I will have answered your question at the end of this without you asking. So what I've done is I've suggested to them to clear everything out of their head except the most important question. Do I answer it? Yeah. I'm supernatural about it. And I will tell them that. I'll go, feel it. It's a piece of cardboard. <laughs> anyway. It's the same with the I Ching. Uh, yeah. I have a, my students do an I Ching exercise where they ask a question and go to one of the online I Ching sites and it's the same thing. Be patient, tribulation, the perseverant person succeeds. Yeah. And, it's know. all it's all been done for yeah. thousands and thousands of years and to some people it's brand new and they're like, oh this is yeah. this is really wonderful. Like like what I brought last year I brought dolphin tears. <laughs> yes, I have dolphin tears. But this time I brought Moonlight homeopathy. This is this is a vial of homeopathic water that's been charged by the rays of the moon on October 5th, the full moon, 2017. I have these. It can also be used as a magic wand, by the way. So I mean, do we sell snake oil? <laughs> Do people buy snake oil? Yes. Buyer beware. That's the bottom line. Yes, this lady right here. So you say you have you read people in ways that you know, we don't like to stereotype now, especially in modern society. Right. We don't want to judge people on the basis of their shoes. Right. But yet that's the stock and trade. Yes. So please share with us like who what is the most susceptible type of person? to this kind of shit. <laughs> Everybody is. Because it seems to me that women more li are more likely to get sucked into No, science. no, no, no. I, I would say there are more women psychics, but I think that's a that's a blanket, again, a blanket statement. I, I think that men are more reluctant to sit down and listen to an, another person give them advice like that, unless it's their wife or something. They don't want to hear it. So, I don't know what the, the dynamic there is, but that, and that was kind of two questions. Yes, that's what we do. We do that automatically, you know? We make judgments all the time. It's just having the sensibility to, it's in my, one of my books I use this quote. It's like, you have, to be dis, you have to be discreet. You don't just say everything that comes to your mind. You have to be discreet and pointed towards the future. You see, you, when you see somebody and they walk to you, walk into the psychic room, you're looking at them and you're saying, you're gathering maybe it takes two or three seconds to get the big picture, and you're also saving the last slice of the pie, which is the positive outcome for their future for the end of the reading. See, so you lay out everything that you guess, like you look at their shoes, and boy, are those some ugly looking shoes, you know, and you're like, you're going through some hard times, but things are going to get better. You know what I mean? I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but, but unfortunately, 
I, it, it, we don't want it to be that way because it's racism and everything else. But guess what? That's the way the world is. And that's, the, that's why my book is called Psychic Blues. Because we do this, it's just, it takes a certain sort of sociopath to make a living at it. <laughs> right? Right, so I was actually asking you for specific characteristics that would lead you to say, to, to make certain probable guesses. Well, like I said, if somebody's wearing some really knocked down shoes, or they've got like a ton of makeup on, and I mean, you know, and they've got a really bad rug on their head, you, know, you can kind of say, well, you know, you, you've had some good times and some bad times, but you're a survivor, and you, you always, you, you've up and, been up and down a few times in your life, and you always manage to land on your feet. See what I mean? And they'll go, usually. I mean, and the, the whole trick is to get people to nod is really important to the rest of the people who are waiting in line. Uh, there used to be a thing in carnival days. In the carnival days, the psychic would be sitting in a tent, and the flap would be open, and the sitter would be sitting with the back towards the outside of the tent, and the reader would be looking out of the tent. And if the reader was starting to do really bad, and some of their guesses weren't hitting, and there was a, there's usually a line of people waiting, and they're like looking in the tent, and they're looking, so the psychic would lean forward and go, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? And the woman starts going, yes, 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 yes. And people in the line are going, God, he's really good. And I look at that, she's going, yeah, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? True story. So, so it's more of a trick than anything else, see? There, there's not a lot of empathy. You, if you're a con artist, you learn how to gently insinuate knowledge that you observe. And a police officer, police officer is called, uh, what is it called, the blue, blue sense. If you were like a cop in Brooklyn and you've worked there for 20 years, you're gonna have more blue sense than a cop that works in some town in Tennessee where you only have one crime a year. It's just sense that you learn from, you know, you look down the street, the lights are off, I think I'm going to go down the side of the street where the lights are on. You listen to your intuition, you don't say, oh, no, I'm going to go down the dark side, I don't care, i got a gun. No, you say, I'm going to take the safe path. So you judge the path and just take it. Yes, sir? Mark, I was just curious, how often do you like to prepare before the phone, uh -huh. for example? Perhaps looking at registration information. Ah, this good question. I'm so glad you asked because I was going to get to that right now. Okay. I will be glad to help you. All right, so that's sort of the tail end of this now. How was I able to know all those things about those, those very specific things about the people who I called on? It's called pre show. And it's one of the most powerful weapons a mentalist has, and for me, it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. I went on Facebook. I got all of your names from Barry. Everybody's name was on a list. I went on Facebook. Well, Susan helped me quite a bit on this. We called through. I looked at pictures of all of you. I scrolled pretty far back. I made a list of notes. I took those notes, I boiled them down into what are called, these are called a mnemonics. How many people are familiar with mnemonics? This is the hard way to do it. This is how mentalists used to do it in the old days. Now they just use an earpiece. <laughs> they have a guy backstage reading these things off, okay? But for example, I wrote here, um, Pat K does healthy chestnut Tai Chi. <laughs> so all I had to do was kind of remember that sentence or refresh myself a little bit and then I had JB does cards as Virgo at Sarah's wedding. Sarah was her name, I forgot that part. <laughs> Dave B was Davy in Georgia, born in September for the eclipse. Right? Uh, William Rock in Hand. William's asleep. Sorry. <laughs> 
Tracy Torres is naval when she's in Paris in May to see Blade Runner. Lance Elsie is on Xanadu 225. Wasn't Xanadu the address? Xanadu is the address. I, I mean, the minute you did it, I knew how you got the information. Oh, but you just couldn't give it to me, could you? <laughs> <laughs> And that spell is Lance L.C., isn't it? So helpful. That's okay. My, here's the one I missed. Michael H. plays guitar with Stephen and Mary and Scorpio on the 19th. He didn't show up. This is one of the pitfalls of... Uh, you do this work, a guy doesn't show up. You're like, I'm trying to go... He's the only guy who looks like he plays guitar. <laughs> Anyway, so this is, this is what mediums do today. But especially the ones that are, I call it, on the ascendant. On the ascendant means they have not made it yet, and they need hits like this. So the people go away from their show and say, there's no way in the world we could have known that. And yet what we do every day, we willingly go on Facebook and put up our most intimate information, including photographs about everything, including what we eat. Did I get to Perry? Where's Perry? See, you're Perry? No. Oh, that is Perry. But you don't look like your photo on Facebook, do you? <laughs> you don't? Want to. Yeah, okay. Because this was the one I was waiting for. <clears throat> Check this out. <laughs> Perry photos food in Subi Libra. You know where I got that from? Yeah. Okay, so he's Perry is into photo photography, but he really likes taking pictures of food, right? Okay. And then my favorite one was a couple of months ago. You found found a can of soup that was like expired, twenty years old or something. <laughs> and you're a Libra, right? See, now that would have been pretty. Specific. So this guy that we just busted, we should I? I don't know. You can tell the story, but you only have a few minutes. But just don't All say right, his name. Real quick, what we did is we made up face, fake Facebook accounts, and we uh, loaded them with false information about Susan and I, and then we went to this guy's show, and we watched him, and he was so accurate. It was just like. And he wasn't making any mistakes at all. So I was just like, whoa. And sure enough, he comes right over to us, starts telling me all these things about me and about her and her brother who died of pancreatic cancer. <laughs> she doesn't have a brother. He's my twin brother. <laughs> my twin, Andy. And the guy's taking it hook, line, and sinker. And now, how we made this a conclusive test for anybody who wants to do this in the future is some of the things that were posted on the Facebook page, we didn't know about. So what happened is he started telling things to, to us that we didn't know about. So we had to just go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he was asking, he goes, who's, what was the dog's name? Buddy. Who's Buddy? And I'm going, uh, uh you, that's your dog. <laughs> Who smoke? Who who used to smoke and quit smoking? And, and you said that's my brother. And, and he goes, not you, her. Yeah, it started to go downhill because there was so much information that he was using that we didn't know about, and we couldn't keep up with it anymore. So anyway, he's done because we have the screenshots of the Facebook stuff, and then we have the transcript of his entire show, and we're going to match those up. And then the reporter's going to interview this guy, but he's going to interview this guy by saying, you are so amazing and so accurate. Can you explain how you have these abilities and let himself dig himself even deeper? And then, boom, the cuffs go on. Okay. <laughs> yes, a few more questions. And, and, and this is not cold reading, what you're just talking about. This is about. called hot, hot reading. There you go. Okay. And hot reading is out there. It's not hard. It is, but again, once a psychic reaches a certain point where he's making several thousand dollars a week, they get lazy. They don't care anymore. I don't just do cold readings. But when they need it, they'll dip back into the pool, believe me. Yes, sir. Has social media been a great windfall for psychics? Absolutely. Sure. 
Maybe not just easy. for sidekicks. Uh, yeah, not just for sidekicks. Politicians, politicians, NSA, CIA, FBI. Do I need to go on? I mean, I don't want to sound like a computer, conspiracy theorist, but you're putting it out there, folks. People are going to use it, and they do, and they will, and they know what you want to buy and what you want to eat and everything else. So let's just hope that it all turns out good. Yes. I have a feeling that your memory is as good as it used to be, because I can see the initials you're on. Yeah, I did write a few initials on my head, but I didn't have to resort to them because I had a podium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, pull out your glasses, Mark, your reading glasses. Oh, okay. Yes. Mark, what do you say to somebody who's either about to go or who has recently been to a psychic But that's two completely different things, though. To, I mean, to, to somehow prove to them that it's just crap that they're going to do. Well, I can't prove, you can't prove that. All, all you can do is say, buyer beware. And they're making life decisions up, you know. Oh, I know. I have people who used to call me three and four times a day. And some of them wouldn't even take a bath unless they said it was okay for them to do that. So I call them psychic junkies. So there's levels of insanity to go with that. All you can do is say, try not to give them any hints and don't answer any of their questions. Because I guarantee if you go to a psychic, most of them say, here's your tea. Now, how can I help you? What's your question? Why would you answer that? It's your you're psychic. Yeah. 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 You tell me. And I, I went to one last year, a year, year or two ago, and I, I decided I would sit perfectly still, feet flat on the floor, hands in my lap, try and have a complete death mask on my face. The reading was over like that. She goes, I can't tell you anything. Everything's fine. Now you'll have to leave. <laughs> tell tell them record simple. it. Record it. If, here's the thing. This is important, so remember this part. If, if they, he or she really wants to go, have them have three very specific questions in their mind that have to do with someone who's passed over that literally no one could know. Only they know. And if that psychic answers any of those, one of those three questions, then get in touch with me. <laughs> we got a million dollars. <laughs> I'm willing to split 5% five, five to you. <laughs> so you, you go in with expectations, but make those expectations be really high because the bar is going to be really low. Yep. So I have three questions in my mind that only I know. And so does Randy. Randy had told me this. He has three things that he knows. And if somebody ever really, like they could do that, would change the whole physics, would be turned up, upside down in one day, then change, I'm willing to change my mind. But, you know, because that's usually a convincer. Right. It's like, you tell me what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mark, are you familiar with the book, uh, Pulling Houdini? No. It's a, it's a great book about being a magician. Yeah. And he was a very smart man who was working on a PhD and he dropped out of school at Cornell and became a magician. And he, you remind me of him in a way because the thing he struggled most about was dealing with he, that aspect of magic doing psychic readings. Right. Because he, he, his, his conscious, you know, other yeah. things, he could say, this is a trick. Yeah. He would say that this is a trick, but people still believe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Beliefs. Oh yeah, that's why I kind of watch it when I do TV now, because I work really hard to explain something, and after I explain it, it doesn't make any difference. Like I did the Jeff Probe show, and we literally showed all the things that I've talked to you about this afternoon, and in the studio part of the show, is that Jeff Probe says, does anyone have any questions for Mark? Lady in the back, what's your question? How can I get a reading from Mark? He says, we just explained to you how this is done. I don't care. You know, it's, like, it's frustrating. It really is frustrating. But all we can do is try and spread the word and hope for the best. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm wondering about your use of the phrase passed over when you're talking to us about something. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of 
Yes, well, you, you, you can't say, yeah, they're dead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're dead as a doornail. You know, so. No, you got to have some kind of a, a, a lofty uh, yeah. expectation, you know, the, the, the greener pastures or whatever. So, And I, I did seances for many years, so I learned to use terms like, you know, uh, ever, ever after, uh, Elysian fields, or anything. You want to comfort people if you can, so, yeah. Has nothing to do with Passover. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have a question that he had somewhere to say or something? Because he was really, he really wanted to expose. Something. Right. Well, he had, a, he, yes, he had a, a, it's still locked up. So, yeah, he has, and every Halloween they drag it out and they try and, uh, they try and get somebody to get it. But uh, it's just not going to happen. So, uh, they, and his wife had a seance for 10 years after his death trying to, because uh, they had a certain set of coded words that they, that, that was just between the two of them. And for a while she said that they got it, but then she turned around and said, no, nah, we just did that for publicity. So that pretty much put the kibosh on the whole thing, and now nobody trusts any of that anymore. But there is an envelope, I've seen it, and I did a seance up in Canada where they actually brought that envelope in me. But it didn't make much sense to me because they challenged me to guess what they're, say what is inside the envelope. And then when I did my best to get it, the guy just says, nope, that's not it. Bye. Well, nobody opened it. So how are we supposed to know? So apparently some people know, but I don't, I don't buy it. I think it was, it was a very calculated publicity stunt that no longer holds water. So, unfortunately. Are you saying the envelope is empty? What's that? Are you saying the envelope is empty? No, I think there is something in the envelope, but I think that somebody steamed it open along the way, and uh, it's not doesn't it doesn't it's not as secret as it once was. Yeah. Yes, sir. Not only do you have amazing powers of observation, but you're also really good with advice. You gave me one of the best pieces of advice in my life. I did. You did. Today? Not today. Oh. Years ago. Years ago. Do you want to share that with me? You told, you told me I was dating a sociopath. Yeah. You were right. I was right? That's from my years of experience. <laughs> Thank you. Not me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. No, no, it's not you. Yes. Whew. Okay. Those who tell don't know. Right. And those who know don't, don't tell. tell. That's right. Last. Yeah. And that's why my contention is if anybody had these sort of powers or abilities, they would be the last person in the world to stand up and tell the world about it. And I, when I did work on the 900 line, I had a few fascinating moments where, because one of the things that was great about 900 was you could from week to week, you could change your moniker. In other words, one week you could be a tarot card reader, and if you decided you wanted to, the next week you could be a ghost hunter. Mm -hmm. And the next week you could be this or that, or a dream interpreter. So I had some times on that phone where I really wondered what was going on. So, and I think that when people have these sort of quote unquote paranormal experiences, to them, it's really real. And you can't, you can't tell them you're crazy, or, you know. And there, have you read my book or you just bought it? I just bought it. Okay, because there's, you'll see in there, there's a couple stories where it's like, really? You know, I really had to put the phone down and just say, now wait a minute, you're a skeptic. You know better, you know, this person must be crazy, even though they, their story was totally sane and their details were all in order. So... I believe there's something out there, but I don't think any of us will ever know what it is. They're just not cut out to be that way, and I got a cut, and I'm probably going to end with that because don't come rushing up here asking me for a lot of numbers. <laughs> Boy, and I don't do exorcisms either. So that's why I'm out. Yes, I'm almost done. One more. As, as a skeptic, I, and I want to share with you, you only know what they told you. You don't know that what they told you is what actually happened. That's right. But that's why I say, I mean, I have an open mind. I don't, but I know 
What is more likely? That's what I want to end with. Just remember, what is more likely? That's the, that just totally makes sense to me. Given, given what we know with science, science would know if somebody could, could do this, any of these things that these guys say, and yet they get away with it day after day after day. And I could have, if I decided to be a complete scoundrel, I could have made money, but I don't want to make that kind of money. I'd rather talk to all of you. Thanks for listening to me.